already, even though he's only 10. <laughs> but yeah, so um, this morning, and I just want, obviously, we want to hear from God. And so I just want to pray that God uses the words that I've prepared. And if he wants to say something else, that he can. And I want to also thank pastors Eddie and Laura for entrusting me with the microphone and being up here because it's a it's a big thing and it's wonderful to see so many people here and people I know and new faces so yeah we're doing a series on Psalm 23 and last week Pastor Laura did a beautiful preach on the first verse the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want and this morning we're going to continue on and we're talking about God being the God of restoration. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever lost photos or data that was precious to you. Now, maybe going back many, many years, you didn't have that much data. So maybe my parents and maybe when I was young, but maybe something got lost in a house move. But nowadays, it's more common on a camera, on a phone, on a memory card, uh, forgetting the password of an account. And maybe they're the only copies of something. I remember back before cameras could actually be used properly as, fo or no, phones could be used properly as cameras. I'm that old. Um, and so we had a digital camera. And we took that digital camera on a weekend away and we were in Edinburgh, and we took lots of pictures, including many of Edinburgh Castle. So I used to, being a tech geek, I used to always then back up the photos from the memory stick onto an external hard drive and onto the hard drive of the computer. But I hadn't got this done when a friend asked us because they'd borrow our digital camera. So I said, no problem. Off they went with it for a week's holiday or a weekend. And during their holiday, I got a message saying, the memory card's near full. He says, no problem. That's fine. You can delete any of the photos on it, except the ones from Edinburgh. Because I haven't managed to back those up yet. Oh. Now, you can probably tell, if I'm standing here remembering it, you're probably going to be able to tell what happened here. Because if they had deleted the other ones, it wouldn't have been a story. <laughs> but the camera came back. They took their photos off, handed it back to me, and all the Edinburgh ones were gone, and all the other ones were there. So, so the ones I didn't need were there, the ones I wanted were gone. I, I wasn't overly happy about it, but there's nothing you can do at that stage. Now, I pretty much back up everything still to my hard drive, to the cloud, probably two accounts, I, I, and I'm probably still missing something. But. Today, we can do things like restore a file from a backup. We can restore a phone from a backup. We can store our WhatsApp from a backup. And it gives us that sense of, OK, that's good. But this morning, I want to talk about God being the God of restoration, of God restoring stuff to us. And after last week of looking at verse 1, this morning, we're going to look at verses 2 and part of 3 of Psalm 23. And that says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. A little reminder about this, this Psalm and the Psalms generally. The Psalms, right about the middle of the Bible in the Old Testament, they're a book of poetry and songs. About half of them are attributed to King David or David and then to others as well. Psalm 23 was written by David. But it was written, you know, before he was a king, before he was a warrior, he was a shepherd boy. In the hills and in the fields around Bethlehem. Being a shepherd was not a sought after position. It wasn't his life's dream to be a shepherd boy. You know, there were, he had older brothers. And all those older brothers, they had positions and they had responsibilities in the family. And as a younger, 
he was sent to be with the sheep and take care of the sheep. It was isolated. Shepherds would spend weeks, days and weeks, just with the sheep. And it was sometimes very dangerous. We read that David protected the sheep from a lion and from a bear. So David had first-hand experience of being a shepherd. So when he wrote this song and said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in lack. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He knows what he's talking about. It comes from his own life experience. What God did with him reminds him of what he had to do with the sheep. And I feel the key part of this passage that we want to look at is he restores my soul. I looked up what restore means. I think you have to do that when, when you're doing a message. And it means to restore is to bring back or reestablish. So a previous practice, a previous situation, a previous right. It means to return, to return something to its form of condition, to its form of place, to its form of position. It means to repair or to renovate. So it returns something to its original condition. And it means to give back to the original owner as well. And we know that God is a God of restoration. Throughout the Bible and throughout history and throughout my life and throughout your life, we can identify things where God has restored. In the Bible, we can see that God does all of these things. He establishes and he reestablishes. He returns things to their former condition. He repairs and he renovates. He returns things that have been taken away or stolen. And it's important to understand that this, this restoration is in the very, very nature of God. One of God's names in the Bible, and Julius actually said this earlier on, is... He's a God of restoration. He is Jehovah Rapha. And that word means to heal, to make whole, and to restore. So when that says in the Bible, that's declaring that he is the God who makes things whole and he restores. And if we just look at a few occasions in the Bible where we see restoration, some that I can think of, we've got the whole book of Job. Now, if you don't know, Job in the Old Testament, he loses everything. He loses his family. He loses all his crops and his animals and his wealth. He loses his health. And he's right at the end of himself. And yet, he holds on to God. And in the book of Job, in chapter 42, it tells us that God restored everything to Job. And even more. Job 42 verse 12 says, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life with more than the former part. And I think it's quite significant there as well that this restoration isn't, doesn't exclude age. It doesn't matter where you are in your journey. It doesn't matter what's happened and it doesn't matter what age you are. God can restore things back to your life. We know that he restores health. The whole Bible's full of stories of God healing. And, one, and Jesus' ministry was full of it as well. And in Luke 17, we read about the healing of the ten lepers. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out, in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Leprosy was and still is a horrible disease. These men were in pain, these men were very ill, and all ten of them were healed by Jesus. 
they were cleansed and their health was restored. But what I find really significant about this story, it wasn't just about the restoring of their bodies. It was also about the restoring of community. In, the, in those times, if you had leprosy, you were excluded. You had to stay away from people. You possibly had to stay outside the camp or outside the city. You weren't allowed to be close to your family. And in fact, if somebody came near you, you had to call out unclean. So when Jesus sent them to the priests, clean, he was restoring them back to their community. Because it was the priests who had to say, you're clean. It's the priests that had to look at the skin and said, that skin is okay. So Jesus healed them and restored them into the position of family and into their communities and away from isolation. We also look at Jesus restoring relationships. And what I want to reference here is Peter. If we think about the crucifixion and what happened, Jesus told Peter he would deny him three times. Peter, not going to happen. I'm fine. Never me. I love Peter. He's, he's so pig-headed. <laughs> A bit like me. <laughs> um, but he did. He betrayed Jesus three times, and then he felt horrible about it. We then go through the story that Jesus was crucified. He was buried. He rose again. And Peter saw him. But we see in John 21 that Peter was back fishing. He went back right to the start of the journey that we see him on. He had already seen the risen Jesus, but he went back because he didn't know what to do. We really don't know why, and it doesn't say exactly why, but I can only assume, and we think, obviously, that Peter, he was uncertain. He was still feeling guilty. He was still feeling ashamed. He was confused, and he was fishing. And Jesus comes along, and he tells him to put the uh, net out. And they take in a big lot of fish, and he has breakfast with them. And Jesus tells them to feed my sheep. Jesus restores Peter back to his calling. He restores Peter back to relationship with him. So I love these beautiful examples of restoration and of how God can restore our health. He can restore community. He can restore our lives. He can restore our friendships. And it's just wonderful. And I hope that you've got a testimony of that. Because I've got many testimonies of that. And if you don't have a testimony of that restoration, if that's not something you know, this morning I pray that you will grab a hold of that and you will get introduced to Jesus so that you can see this restoration power happening in your own life. But I want to look at these verses in particular. Because it says, remember, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by still waters. And he restores my soul. In some versions, it says he refreshes my soul as well. So what does this mean? Because we've looked at relationships. We've looked at health. We've looked at, you know, um, calling, we've looked at community. What does it mean to restore my soul? What, what is my soul? <laughs> Probably my first question, what's my soul? And our soul is the core of who we are. It's what makes us unique. It's what makes us different. It's what makes us different from the animals. It's which allows us to commune with God. It's our identity, it's our emotions, it's connected to both our physical body and our spiritual being. In Genesis 2.7 we read, then the, Lord God, then the Lord God formed man out of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So your soul holds the breath of God that infusion of the divine in us. 
Our soul is something which encompasses and includes everything that we are. And God wants to restore that as well. In the half-term break just there, a few weeks ago, we took a weekend away and we visited Nuremberg. Um, if you haven't been, it's an amazing city. There's so much to see. There's so many sites, so much culture. Uh, it's a beautiful old city. We had picked up this museum pass um, and started touring around. I think our favorite was, especially for Jonathan, was the Future Museum, where we interacted with a robot that talked to us with ChatGDP. So it's like, OK. You could actually, what was really funny, you could tell the delay. You know that little delay if you've used ChatGDP where you put it in, and it's calculating the response as it goes and fires up its engines? The robot would, and then it would talk to you. Anyway. Um, but we also, because we had this pass, we also decided to try out some of the other museums. So we went to the National Museum. We went to the Spiel Museum, the Toy Museum. We went to the Hangman's Museum, obviously. And we also went to a tiny, tiny museum, which was a house which celebrated the Nuremberg Roastbratwursten. So, <laughs> which had a little golden sausage on, on a, as a statue in it. It was quite random, but there you go. The things you find out. But when we were there, we also visited the Imperial Castle in Nuremberg. And in history, this castle was important, both the castle and the city, as part of the Holy Roman Empire in Germany. It was an amazing castle. It was a beautiful city. But as we toured the castle, we discovered that, like many other old cities, many other old buildings, many other old castles, that over the years, it had been partially destroyed in the past. Walls, the castle, the tower, all parts of it had had damage, had worn out. Some of that was general wear and tear, kind of happens with thousand year old buildings, but also from battles in history and also from World War II bombing, which happens in many places in Germany as well. And that's what our souls feel like sometimes. Maybe not yours, but mine definitely. Um, we feel things are broken down. Things are a bit out of place. The walls are kind of like crumbling. Maybe the rooms inside are a bit faded. And that's how it feels. But how, how does that happen? I was thinking about this as I was preparing for this. And I was thinking, how does our soul get so worn out, so broken down? How does it get so damaged? And I noticed a few things about it. Maybe firstly, it's a fact that we live in a really fast-paced world. We live in a very fast, busy work city. You know, I don't know about you, but in my workplace, there's many people that are there. What we would say in English is burning the midnight oil. They're there many, many hours. And I always seem to be busy. I don't seem to get to the end of my task list. And that's not just my work task list, that's my personal task list as well. And being me, mine is actually in task lists where I check it off to make myself feel good. <laughs> and I use an app for it, obviously. <laughs> but I don't feel I'm up to date with life. I don't feel that I'm up to date what's happening in my own world. You know, I'm late sometimes with birthday greetings. I'm late with replying to messages. And then we've got the WhatsApp groups. I don't know about yours, but ours is from clubs. It's from scouts. It's from school. It's, oh, it's, it's impossible to keep up with. And then somebody says, we've got another app to download to communicate. And I'm going, no, I've had enough. We live in an always-on world. Instant media and instant 24-hour news. It's a social media world. Quite regularly, we can feel worn out. Quite regularly, we can feel alone in a crowd. We can feel friendless, 
can feel that we've no friends, even though we've got hundreds of connections on social media. We can feel overwhelmed with the news, with elections, with wars, with conflict, with floods, natural disasters. And that itself just feels like a pressure on us. We can be full of worry for the future. Full of worry for our family and our friends. We might be full of worry for tomorrow. And we can sometimes feel that we're in the edge of burning out. Our battery feels empty. This is our modern society. This is the demands on our time become more and more and more. Our soul, that innermost being in us, starts to get tarnished. Starts to look, the shine has come off a little bit. Starts to get worn out and tattered and rusty. It can feel like the castle where the walls have broken down through wear and tear. The rooms are faded. The jewels aren't as bright. And maybe that's how you feel this morning. This morning, if that is you, this psalm and these verses are directly speaking to you. It's for me, it's for us, it's for you. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. It might not just be that, though. It might be what's happening around you. But it also could be what's happened to you. Friendship breaks down. A relationship breaks down. Feels like part of our soul has been broken, has been snapped off. An illness lingers. A family member's ill. It affects our soul. We try to stay full of joy, full of faith but it just seems to be wearing. A job loss, relationship issues, mental health struggles. Each time, it feels like another chip and another bang and another crack at who we are. There's many, many other things I could add here, and it just seems like an assault on who we are. And there's things that can happen which cause damage to our physical lives as well. And those things have a massive impact on who we are and our innermost being, our soul, our identity and our emotions. That can make you question your whole identity. Who am I? Who does God say I am? Question even the calling of God, where God is, what's he doing in this situation? And that might be you this morning. Things may have happened to you. And you feel that your soul is so broken, damaged, chipped and worn out, that it can't even be restored. It's beyond repair. But this morning, this psalm and this passage is for you. It's for us, and it's definitely for me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And then, there's sometimes the consequences of our own actions. The choices that we've made. We've all sinned. Let's be clear. We've all made mistakes. And even when we become a Christian, we still make mistakes. We still rebel we still fall into temptation, we still sin. We are not perfect. We have to repent and seek forgiveness, yes. And we know that Jesus does forgive us and does put us right. And we are forgiven. But there are sometimes consequences in this life to the actions that we've made and the actions that we've taken. And we have to deal with those. So maybe 
we've lost friendship or relationship with others because of our actions. Maybe we're dealing with guilt and shame of something we've done in the past. Maybe we lost our temper on the way to church this morning. Never done that. <laughs> Maybe we've been tempted on that old thing and we've given in again. Maybe I'm li we're living life with resentment and unforgiveness for stuff that's happened. We've lost our way and we feel distant from God. We don't feel like God is our shepherd. We don't feel and we don't allow him to input into these areas. We may be afraid to allow God to be our shepherd. We may not even trust him. And we're causing damage to our own soul. But this morning... These verses in this psalm are for you, for us, and for me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. It is God who can restore our soul in each and every one of these circumstances. I love the imagery in these verses. He makes me lie down in green pastures. David, the shepherd boy, is remembering all those times with the sheep. He would bring them to the green pastures. They weren't allowed to just wander off where they wanted to. Didn't always go so well for the sheep when they did. So the shepherd brought them to the green pastures. They were directed by the shepherd. They weren't just wandering. He brought them to a good place. A place of restoration, a place of food, a place of refreshing. Now, I'm no shepherd. I work in IT. But I did grow up on a farm. And it wasn't sheep, but it was cows. So there is a bit of an analogy here and a connection here. But I remember when we wanted to move our animals. You didn't just let them walk randomly where they wanted to go. We were moving them from field to field from pasture to pasture to give them good food, to keep them safe. And all of these pastures were fenced in. Again, protection. We would go out as a family and we would close gates and we would put up barriers and we would move the tractor and we'd have the dog to help us get them moving in the right direction because we were doing the best for these animals. They wanted to run off or wander off in a different direction we would make sure they went in the right direction. And that's what David's talking about. And that's what God does for us. He brings us to a place where it is good for us, where we can be nourished, where we can be safe, and where we can rest. And then it says, he leads me beside still waters. Animals don't like to drink from rushing waters. The noise, the chaos, it creates a fear in them. They want still water where they can drink without worry. Without concern, without the busyness of life. And that's what God wants to do for us. He wants us to bring us to a place of stillness, away from the rush, away from the loudness, from the speed of life. And this reminds me of Matthew 11, 28 to 30. And I'm going to read this from the message translation because I think it's great. Are you tired, worn out, burned out in religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. The last part of this passage this morning is, he restores my soul. It seems hard to pin this down. That soul thing quite ethereal, quite a, you know. But I feel that this is probably the most significant and important part of this. 
Because when God brings us to the green pastures, to the still waters, he restores our soul. God reestablishes who we are. God returns our innermost being to its former condition, to the condition that it was designed to be. God repairs and God restores. God returns to us that which has been lost or stolen. Some of you, some of you who know me and know Colleen and I, know that several years ago we had a difficult time in our marriage. And I've asked Colleen if we can share this, and it's fine. And most of that was down to me. Looking back now, I can see my, my soul was tarnished. My soul was broken and damaged. Like all of us, life had happened. Stuff had happened. My life had been full of some knocks, bumps, hurts, betrayals, and of sin and my own mistakes. I thought I had dealt with all this stuff, but it had affected my soul. It had affected my innermost being. I had dealt with it, but I hadn't let God deal with it. I had gone to a counselor, and this was really good. It was a Christian counselor. So let me be clear. It is a really good thing to talk to someone. Talk to a friend. Talk to a pastor. Get wise counsel. Go to a counselor. Get wise counsel. That is, um, there's, there's no doubt that that is a really good thing to do. And God does use it. I had got some good wisdom for that and I had changed some things, but there was still this brokenness in my soul that was causing problems. I wanted to try to control and manage the image I presented. But really, all I did was to cause more problems in my marriage because I didn't go to God with it as well. I didn't let him work on me. I didn't let him restore my soul. I was acting out of a place of insecurity, out of a place of my control. And ironically, the control came because I didn't feel in control. I felt completely out of control, so I wanted to hold on to the tiny bit of control that I thought I had. And I pushed my family away. I thank God that he intervened. I thank God that he was my shepherd. And as my shepherd, when I was in danger, he rescued me. He challenged me. He made me look at how I was and offered to come in and help me and help fix me and help heal me and restore that which was broken. It was painful. But that's sometimes what the shepherd has to do. If we're in danger, the shepherd has to protect the sheep. Rescue them. And sometimes the shepherd must even have to act as a vet and remove that thorn or help that injury. And these things can be painful and they're not understood by the sheep. So then I didn't always understand what God was trying to do in me. But I remember... Back to being on the farm again. I remember we had drainage ditches. So round the bottom of fields as the water ran off, they went into these drainage areas with water in them. And sometimes they were fenced off and secure, but sometimes animals managed to get into them, get pushed in whatever way. And usually we moved it to somewhere where it could climb out. It was easier for the animal to get out. But I remember one in particular where that just wasn't happening. This cow was not managing to get out of the drainage area and it was getting tireder and it was getting tireder and it was getting weaker and it was getting weaker. And my dad worried this animal's going to pass away, gonna die in this water-filled ditch. So 
I was tasked of getting in beside it. So there's me in this drainage thing, probably up to about here in water. Um, I had wellies on, but Wellingtons, but they weren't doing any good because they were also full of water. And my job was to reach under it with a rope, under its front legs, and get the rope around the other side. Then my father tied the rope with knots attached to the tractor, and we dragged that animal out of this drainage ditch. The animal was not happy. That animal was screaming and shouting and thought that we were causing it pain. But we were rescuing it. If we had not done that, that animal was going to die. It was running out of strength. And it was like that for me. I was a bit screaming and shouting, not knowing what was happening. But when I opened up and I allowed God, the good shepherd, into my innermost being, it was painful. It wasn't nice. But I know that he was being my shepherd. He was saving my future. He was saving my marriage. He was restoring my soul. I'm far from perfect. Our marriage is not perfect. It's not us standing here to say it is. But I know without God's intervention and God restoring, there's no, where, no way we would be where we are today. So how does God restore our soul? There are many different ways that were suggested to be restored and rejuvenated. You know, some good exercise, a good night's sleep, good nutritious food. If you're an extrovert, hanging out with people. If you're an introvert, the opposite, being at home with a book. Laughter, a walk in nature, meeting up with a good friend. Holidays, a nice meal with people. And all of these things are good. I would suggest that in today's busy world, it's important to care for ourselves, to carve out these places and these spaces and these times which allow us to become refreshed, renewed, and rejuvenated. And God does work in these, these things. God's made us in a certain way, and God says this is how you can recover, how can you recuperate, and how you can be rejuvenated. He desires us to have rest. And these things are good for our soul. But I want to bring something else. Because those things are good. But I would suggest that there are some things which God wants to bring into our lives. Some better practices. Some excellent practices that we should consider which will restore our souls. And the first one is the practice of reading the Bible. I personally don't do it enough, so I'm speaking to myself up here. In fact, with all of these, I am telling myself what I need to continue to do, but it's a good, good practice. If we dig into the Word of God, if we do the Bible in one year app, if we do the Bible app where you've got your verse coming up and you follow a, a Bible reading program, if you grab a book a, a accompanying book with the Bible, whatever way you do it, can I suggest that digging into the Bible is going to help restore our soul it gives us truth about who we are and about who God says we are which is even more important it gives us truth about what Jesus came to do. He came to forgive our sins. He came to renew us. He came to restore us. And he came to bring us right relationship with the Father. Another practice I would like to suggest is the practice of prayer. And prayer is just conversation. It's just talking to God. It's just bringing him the challenge of the day. 
your thoughts, your worries, your concern, and listening, listening for a response from heaven. Sometimes when I'm praying, I say, God, but you already know this, because he does. You're not telling him something he doesn't know, whether that's positive or whether that's negative, whether that's something that you think, I don't want to talk to He already knows but it does us a world of good to talk it through with him. I sometimes feel as if I just chatter. (laughs) And that's good. Make today, make this week something where you just chatter. Have a chat with God. And if you want to start that, we do have a prayer team at the end. And that prayer team will accompany you on that journey. And just from this morning, maybe you just need to bring the name of Jesus into your conversation with God. Maybe we need to speak the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. So as you talk and as you converse with God or as you come and get prayer along with the prayer team, Maybe we speak the name of Jesus over your day. Maybe we speak the name of Jesus over your health, over your family, over your temptations. Maybe we speak the name of Jesus over your anxiety and over your worries. Another practice, I've just got a few more and then we're finishing. Another practice I would suggest is the practice of solitude. And this is, goes right to the root of this busy world, of this busy life. Find space, find peace, find quietness and find stillness. That's what the Psalm references, the green pastures, the still waters. How do you do that in a busy day? Well, it probably looks different for every single one of you because me going to my work is not the same as somebody going to school is not the same as somebody who's parenting. I've got kids at home. And also, the way that we do that solitude changes. But may I suggest that you should find space. So maybe for you, you need to take a walk. With maybe with headphones on, listening to worship music. Maybe you find it when you're doing painting or craft out in nature on a bike ride. And this is a challenging one. Maybe we need to put the phone in another room or turn it off entirely and find them space and solitude. Can I suggest that another good practice is the practice of community? And it's wonderful to see us here today in this community. Community in a Sunday, community in our small groups, but community with your friends, sharing a meal, sharing a testimony over a meal, sharing what good God's done in your life this last week. And that happens in our small groups and that happens on a Sunday, but don't just limit it to that. Invite somebody for dinner. You know, send a message, create community. It helps restore our soul. The practice of confession and the practice of forgiveness. When we confess our sins, it starts to restore our soul. When we forgive and we continually practice forgiveness, because forgiveness, let's be honest, is not a one-off thing when we're forgiving other people. We go back day after day. As we do that, it restores our soul. My final one is the practice of service. The practice of helping others. Serving in the house of God. Supporting people who are in need. Supporting a family member who's in a difficult position, situation. Blessing others with finance. Blessing others with your time. Blessing others with generosity. Because as we do to others what Christ has put in us. There's something miraculous about it that helps to restore our souls. 
The world is asking us to constantly be busy and to constantly consume, whether that's media or news or the latest Netflix show. And especially with Christmas coming up, there's more consumption. God calls us to an alternative of rest and restoration. It's a conscious decision to slow down. A conscious decision to do something for others. A conscious decision to read the Bible, to pray, to create space, to enjoy beauty, to enjoy creation, and to enjoy God. For our souls to be renewed and cleansed and refreshed and restored, we need to start enjoying the God who made us. Enjoying our time in his presence, enjoying our time in worship, enjoying our walks in nature and giving thanks to him. Enjoying company with good Christian friends, family, having a meal together. Jesus didn't just come to save us. That was his key thing. But he said himself, he has come to give us life and life in all of its abundance. And when I think to that visit to Nuremberg Castle, as we were going through it, they've rebuilt it. A little bit creatively sometimes. But it looks what it used to look like. They've done a great job, the restoration. There are items from history, items from the Holy Roman Empire. Some are in amazing condition and hidden under glass. But all their items, furniture and rooms, are still being worked on. They're attempting to bring these things back. So this is a journey that we're all on. But God like those experts working on restoring the castle and the items, God is the expert of restoring our soul and restoring our lives. We need God to restore who we are. We've lost part of that image of who he made us to be. Our souls feel tired, feels worn out, or maybe it feels broken and damaged. And only he can do that restoration. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Today, let's allow the shepherd to lead us to the green pastures and to the still waters. Let him restore our soul he is the master at it no one and nothing can do what he can do in our lives and as we're closing if there's anything that you need to talk about today about that or anything that you need prayer about please just come and speak and pray with someone and if we as a church can start to practice community start to practice generosity start to practice forgiveness our community can change and that means our families and our workplaces and our schools and our wider communities and my challenge to you this week and my challenge to me this week is to choose one or two of those practices that we talked about. The practice of take some time out, some time away maybe, slow down, read the Bible, pray, practice solitude, and allow the shepherd restore our souls.